Okay, good morning. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Okay, good morning everybody. Um, this morning, we're going to look at the topic I called the Feast of Bacchus. It's a very interesting topic. You should all have the notes. Um, Okay, we're going to begin with looking at how the, the fall of Jerusalem and the fall of Babylon are both related. In fact, they're, they're, they're parallels and there's much evidence to show this. And so we're going to begin by putting that in place. And we're going to begin with, for the quote from Third Selected Messages, page 417. It says... <coughs> After speaking of the end of the world, Jesus comes back to Jerusalem, the city then sitting in pride and arrogance and saying, I sit a queen and shall see no sorrow. See Revelation 18.7 and we will look at that in a moment. As his prophetic eye rests upon Jerusalem, he sees that as she was given up to destruction, the world will be given up to its doom. So the destruction of Jerusalem is a symbol of the destruction of the world. The scenes that transpired at the destruction of Jerusalem will be repeated at the great and terrible day of the Lord, but in a more fearful manner. So the, the destruction of Jerusalem... Okay, I'll just write that quickly. The destruction... Jerusalem equals the day of the Lord. It says, as men throw off all restraint and make void his law themselves, oh sorry, as men throw off all restraint and make void his law themselves, as they establish their own perverted law and try to force the consciences of those who honour God and keep his commandments to trample the law under their feet, they will find that the tenderness which they have mocked will be exhausted. So you can see right here, the destruction of Jerusalem, which is the day of the Lord, is about uh, a point in time when man makes void God's law and it forces other people to do so. It's real simple. So we understand that this represents the Sunday Law Crisis. Okay, real, real simple to see that. Um, and it goes on to say, it says, a world is represented in the destruction of Jerusalem. And the warning given then by Christ comes sounding down the line to our time. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, Luke 21, 25. Yes, they shall pass their borders and destruction will be in their track. They will engulf the ships that sail upon the broad waters. And with the burden of their living freight, they will be hurried into eternity without time to repent. So, <clears throat> it's referring to Luke 21, 25, and we already studied this, that in Luke there are two um, 
<coughs> two times of distress. There's, there's uh, one that refers to Rome and the other one refers to, to Islam. Okay, and um, you can see that that's, that's mentioned in here in regards to the destruction of Jerusalem. But we know the destruction of Jerusalem on our line begins with Cestius, but is fulfilled with Titus, right? And it's important for us to understand those symbols, but we've, we've laid those things out uh, several times in the past few months. So, let's now go to Revelation 18, and verse 1. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double, according to her works, and the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I said a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. So, this is the destruction, or the fall of Babylon, and you can see that it's a parallel to the fall of Jerusalem, because they both use this term, I said a queen, and I'm no widow, and shall see no sorrow. And Sister White referenced uh, Revelation 18 in the destruction of Jerusalem. It, and it goes on to say, therefore, her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Now, we understand there, there are three binding offs, okay, uh, the priests, the Levites, and the eleventh hour workers. So you've got these three binding offs, followed by seven plagues. So the destruction of Jerusalem begins with the priests, when the law is made void, and it's a progressive destruction that leads down to the seven last plagues. But also, as a fractal of that, within each binding off, you have these three steps, which is the image of the beast test that is followed by seven plagues, right? These three plagues followed by seven plagues. And we will see why that's important to understand this. And in Signs of the Times, December 29th, 1890, speaking about the destruction of Babylon, it says the destruction of Babylon pictures to some degree the final destruction of the world. So here you have two parallels. Destruction of Jerusalem, destruction of Babylon, both destructions of the world. Of which the prophet writes, Behold the day of the Lord cometh. And right here, again, it says the destruction of Babylon. Right, so I can just put here Babylon. It's the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is the Sunday law crisis. Cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Destruction came upon Babylon while the king and his lords were engaged in feasting and revelry. Cyrus and his army marched up the bed of the river Euphrates. For trenches had been dug and the river turned from its course, so that there was no obstruction to their entering the city, provided the gates were opened. The guardsmen were indulging in merriment and revelry, and the city was left without defence. Before the officers were aware, the enemy had entered the city, and escape was impossible. Those in one part of the city were slain or captured, before those in another part knew that the city was invaded. No alarm was sounded, no cry could be raised to warn the people that the forces of Cyrus 
were upon them. It came suddenly and unexpectedly. Okay, you can see how that represents uh, midnight for us. And we're going to show how the destruction of Jerusalem that was represented at the beginning by Cestius is a parallel to the uh, destruction of Babylon. Now it goes on to say here, okay, but in fact, before we read that, when we read Revelation 18, we understand that right here, the angel of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 comes down. So let's mark that. Revelation 18, 1 to 3 comes down. And we understand that those are the first and second angel's messages. The, the third arrives here back in history, but you can't have a third without a first and second. And God never punishes unless he warns you first. So the, he has to make a hold there on the Sunday law that they plan to do and first of all bring the warning message. So Revelation 18, 1-3 is a warning message. right? It's a warning. It's the arrival of the second angel. It's not the empowerment of the second angel. It's the arrival. It's a warning that tells you that this is about to happen, right? And we're going to see that in history. Now, we're told that Millerite history is going to repeat to the very letter, so let's read uh, a little bit about that from Great Controversy, page 389, paragraph 2. It says, The second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844. It was in the summertime, right? And this is when the message was empowered, not when it arrived. It arrived in the spring. Okay, very important. The message arrives in the spring as proclaimed loudly in the summer. And it then had a more direct application to the churches of the United States where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected and where the declension in the churches had been most rapid but the message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. The churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of their refusal of the light of the Advent message. But that was not complete. As they have continued to reject the special truths for this time, they have fallen lower and lower. Not yet, however, can it be said that Babylon has fallen. Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this. The spirit of world conforming and difference to the testing truths for our time exists and has been gaining ground in churches of the Protestant faith in all the countries of Christendom. And these churches are included in the solemn and terrible denunciation of the second angel, but the work of apostasy has not yet reached its culmination. So the message, Babylon has fallen, comes here, but you're going to see what the culmination, what the actual proclamation when Babylon falls, right? And if we were to parallel Millerite history, we could write April 19, 1844 here. But the proclamation, go ye out to meet her, comes at midnight, okay, which was July 21st. So, Sister White says the message was first priest in the summer. So this is spring. And this is summer. Important point. Okay. It goes on to say The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders. So, I, I'm going to read that again. The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, right? Now, we know the coming of the Lord is when Michael stands up and the seven last plagues begin to pour out. And it's preceded by three binding offs. But these, this is typified by the binding off. You've got these three plagues, right, that 
lead you up to where Christ's second coming takes place, marked by these seven plagues. Elijah sees Christ coming on the cloud after he prays seven times. Okay, M many ways that you can show this. Christ's second coming is marked here. This is his first coming where he goes to the cross. Okay, very important to see. This is the cross. And the cross is a symbol of the third step. It's a cross is a symbol of the Sunday law. Okay, I'm going to show that why that's very important to understand. The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and they that receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, the very first thing Christ says to his disciples when they ask him for a sign is be not deceived. Because many false Christs were going to come. Satan is going to come down like an angel of light, right? As he did to test Christ in the wilderness right here. He comes down. And we know that this is the, the false apostles. Um, so, and it's seen there that before the coming of the Lord, this deception has to take place, right? So this is in line because one of the signs that Christ gave was Cestius, right? We'll talk more about that in a moment. So you got Cestius, you got this this um, great deception that's going to happen, and it's all the same sign. Not until this condition shall be reached, and the union of the church with the world, okay, the union of the church with the world. This is the the Sunday law crisis shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete the change is a progressive one and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future now we jump down a paragraph to page 390 paragraph 2 it says Revelation 18 points to the time when as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. It's a warning, right? The church, the church, will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel. The second angel's message arrives here, telling us our condition. And we are told to come out of Babylon. We are not Babylon, but we are in Babylon, because Jehoiakim marks right here, marks the beginning of our captivity. And at the same time we go into spiritual captivity in Babylon, there's a message calling us to come out of Babylon, right? So it's a warning message. And the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate for our communion. So there's a people of God called out of Babylon at 9-11, but when it's reached its final culmination in the summer, right, then it can be said Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and the message will go and call out the remaining people from the Levites and then from the 11th hour workers out of Babylon uh, before the door closes when Michael stands up. Um, <coughs> This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. When those that believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie, then the light of truth will shine upon all those hearts who are open to receive it. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call, come out of her, my people. That's the third angel's message. Okay? So under the proclamation of the second, when it's empowered, you have the third, right? So you can see how they're all related. But you have to have a warning first. So let's look at the warning against Jerusalem. Great Controversy, page 30. It says, for seven years, a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. By day and by night he chanted the wild dirge, a voice from the east, a voice from the west. 
A voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and against the temple, a voice against the bridegrooms and against the brides, a voice against the whole people. This strange being was imprisoned and scourged, but no complaint escaped his lips. To insult and abuse he answered only, Woe, woe to Jerusalem, woe, woe to the inhabitants thereof. His warning cry ceased not until he was slain in the siege he had foretold. So, the, the siege that he's slain in was under Titus. And there's three and a half years between Cestius and Titus and gives us... Oh, let me move that. Confuse that. So you have three and a half here and three and a half here. This is the last week of Christ. Okay, 1260, 1260, cross in the middle. God's dealing with us is ever the same. So you see that this seven years warning is going from 9-11 all the way through to the midnight cry where the fulfillment of the punishment is going to come that's going to be decreed right here by those that are faithful. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, there is a warning written to come out of Babylon. Jeremiah 51, verses 45 and 46. It says, My people, go ye out of the midst of her, and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. And lest your hearts faint, and ye fear for the rumour that shall be held, heard in the land. A rumour shall both come one year, and after that in another year shall come a rumour, and violence in the land ruler against ruler. So we're going to look at this and there was a there was a rumor that was given first to warn the people of God that were in Babylon to come out of Babylon and we're going to look at what that rumor was but it, but it was a warning message that there was destruction coming upon Babylon and they had to get out. And it, this was going to come one year but the following year was going to come a, a rumor but then it would be too late for, for them to, to get out. Um, <clears throat> okay, now the word rumour there, if we go to Daniel 11.44, it says the, 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 the word rumour, if you look it up, is the same as tidings. In Daniel 11.44 it says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. So this rumour is this tidings. And it's the message that God's people give beginning here at 9.11. We begin to understand the message of the east and the north. And we know that right here the kings of the earth are troubled by things that are taking place by both what's happening here uh, in, the, in the sense of internally in the nations there's going to be a civil war okay, because of a, an image that's set up but also because of the workings of Islam and this is the message of the east and the north and Christ is the one that comes from the east and Christ is the true king of the north so they have a, a dual understanding that this message this message of the east and north is about the workings of Christ and how he uses the nations to achieve his aims. The king of the north is Nebuchadnezzar and you can show that it's a type of Christ. Cyrus uh, is the, the king that comes from the east and you can show he's a type of Christ. So he sets up kings, he takes down kings, he uses them for his purpose to achieve his aims. So this message that began to come right here, the message of the second angel, is teaching us, is warning us about what's about to come here. And it's the message of the East and the message of the North. These, these two powers that are going to bring destruction upon Jerusalem and Babylon. Now, sometime, a couple of years ago, we start to understand the message of Ezra 7 9. If we go there, Ezra 7 9, it says, For upon the first day of the month began he to go up from Babylon, 
And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. So we understood April 19, according to the Carian calendar, as the first day of the first month, and it marked the point parallel with 9-11 where God's people were called to come out of Babylon. Right, so there's a there's a nice parallel to Revelation 18. You're come out of Babylon. Another confirmation that we are in captivity in Babylon. And Ezra had in his hand the third decree, but the third decree was not in place, right? There's no third decree there. Okay? He's he, he has it in his hand and we know that it's, he doesn't get to Jerusalem until the first day of the fifth month. So this is the first day of the first month and here was the first day of the fifth month. So we know under Titus there's where the third angel is empowered. That's when the Sunday, first Sunday law goes into place. But in the Christ with the Samaritan woman he comes, he meets her at midnight, and he, he says to his disciples, Do you not have a saying that after four months cometh the harvest? But I'm telling you right now, lift up your eyes and look up, for the, the fields are ready for harvest. So although this is where the third angel's message is empowered, Christ is pointing to midnight. He's saying the harvest is already ready at midnight, and that's important for us to understand. Um, and we see this in the, the the history of the destruction of Jerusalem because Titus is where Jerusalem is destroyed, but it begins with Cestius, right? And that, that is so important to understand. So, although we know that this is where um, the destruction comes upon the Seventh-day Adventist church as a whole. It begins with the priests right here at midnight. And we have to see that and we have to understand that. Now, in Desire of Ages, page 630, paragraph 3, it says, Christ gave his disciples a sign of the ruin to come on Jerusalem. And he told them how to escape. When ye shall see, therefore, Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. How many things? All things, right? Not some things. All things. This warning was given to be heeded 40 years after at the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay? 40 years after. The number 40, right? Now the 40 would take you to AD 70, which is Titus. But Sister White is marking 40 years later as Cestius. So she's tying these two events together, Cestius and Titus. It's just one event, the destruction of Jerusalem. And we will show you, give you another witness for that in a moment, because she can't contradict herself. The Christians obeyed the warning, and not a Christian perished in the fall of the city. So all the Christians that obey the warning, right, that comes in the spring, okay, that's pointed forward to a something that's going to happen right down at this time and obey that one and when that sign comes <coughs> will not perish okay so now Luke 21 is the one that in verse 20 it says and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies then know that the desolation thereof is now so it was something you were to see, right? So the warning comes here, and when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, that's the sign. But could they escape when that sign came? No, right? There was a time period where they had to wait until the army fled away. That was when they were delivered. 
right? So they're not delivered right at that point in time. There's a time period where they have to wait in order for the sign to be fulfilled and they can be delivered. But in Matthew 24, the same sign is given, but it's given in a different context. In verse 15 it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So Daniel, or Christ should I say, is tying the dis the, the the point where Jerusalem is surrounded by armies by the prophecy in Daniel that speaks about the abomination of desolation. So let's go there. Daniel 11, and we're going to read verses 29 to 31. It says, At the time appointed. Now, we know in Millerite history the time appointed was both 1798 and 1844. And we understand, we've put it many times in place, that the time of the end is perfectly fulfilled here. And also, this is October 22nd, 1844. Many proofs we've given to show that. And so therefore, you can show, line upon line, that this is the time appointed. Because we just read in Luke 21, or in that quote, and the reference is Luke 21, that when this happens, all things written will be fulfilled. It's the time appointed. It's the beginning of the end of the world. It's the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of Babylon, which parallel each other. So at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Kidim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So Kittim is a trumpet power which at the end of the world is Islam. So Islam is grieving Rome. It's grieving them and therefore they're going to have intelligence with those that forsake the Holy Covenant. This is the papacy. that We understand this from history. United States and the papacy are going to have intelligence because of something that Islam is doing. And Islam is tormenting. In this time period, and it's going to lead them to have this relationship here, marked by the 21st of February, 1848, where the King of France, Louis, and the Pope make this pact and it causes a civil war, right? So when you bring everything together, it's because of Islam that they, they make this image right here. It says, and arms shall stand on his part. Now Sister White parallels these verses with Daniel 11, 40-45. Daniel 1140, the arms of Stannis Pass, the United States given their armies to the papacy in 1989. And we know that this is a time that's going to repeat right here. So, arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily. Okay, the daily is going to be taken away. And they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. And the abomination that made it desolate was placed in 538 AD. 538 AD. That's very important for us to see. Okay? So when you understand when Christ is speaking about on the Mount of Olives the destruction of Jerusalem. He's tying in this great period of persecution from 538 to 1798 with the destruction of Jerusalem. He's showing that they are the same event. And 538, the period of persecution, is typifying a Sunday law. And it's just said here that the destruction of Jerusalem and Babylon is the day of the Lord, which is the Sunday law crisis. They're, they're tied together. You can't separate them. <coughs> so... Let's now read about a sign that's given 
to show the sign that's going to come upon Babylon because they're both the same thing. So the Lord has to be consistent. If the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of Babylon are the same thing, then the sign given for the destruction of Jerusalem is parallel in the sign given to the destruction of Babylon. Prophets and Kings 551 it says the advent of the army of Cyrus before the walls of Babylon was to the Jews a sign that their deliverance was from captivity was drawing nigh. So when the Roman armies are surrounding Jerusalem it's a sign. When the, the armies of Cyrus are surrounding Babylon it was a sign. And it was a sign that their deliverance from captivity was drawing nigh. It wasn't going to happen right there. It, something had to take place first and there was a period of time before they were delivered. Right? It's showing the same truth. Cestius and Cyrus, they're showing parallel truths. Okay? There's a period of waiting before you are delivered. When Christ goes into the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844, he says, wait. They had to wait for him to do a work first before he could come back to take them to the city. More than a century before the birth of Cyrus, inspiration had mentioned him by name and had caused a record to be made of the actual work he should do in taking the city of Babylon unawares and in preparing the way for the release of the children of the captivity. Through Isaiah the word had been spoken. So we see that he, he took Babylon unawares, suddenly and unexpectedly. But that's not because a warning hadn't been given. A warning had been given. We're going to look at that warning because the warning had been given here in the spring, one year prior to the point where he comes and uh, surrounds Babylon. Now, Great Controversy 29 says, and this, what we're going to read now is in regards to showing that the gate of Jerusalem and the gate of Babylon are being opened are also parallels. Great Controversy 29, paragraph 3 says, Signs and wonders appeared, foreboding disaster and doom in the midst of the night, an unnatural light shone over the temple and the altar. Upon the clouds at sunset were pictured chariots and men of war gathering for battle. The priests ministering by night in the sanctuary were terrified by mysterious sounds. The earth trembled and a multitude of voices were heard crying, Let us depart hence. This great, sorry, the great eastern gate, which was so heavy that it could hardly be shut by a score of men, and which was secured by immense bars of iron fastened deep in the pavement of solid stone, opened at midnight without visible agency. So again, Sister Y is tying and tying us with Cestus. She's put it at midnight when those gates of iron are opened. Okay. Very important for us to see. But the fall of Babylon is also marked by the same event. In Isaiah 45, 1 and 2, it says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand have I holden to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. So there's a prophecy there talking about when he's going to open the gates of Babylon and at the very same time he's going to loose the loins of kings because at that very time there was a drunken A drunken feast, and it was a, a, a licentious feast, okay? Marked by much licentiousness, it was a, it was a drunken orgy that, that was taking place at the very time 
So Belshazzar was having this, this feast at this time and his loins were loose the very time that Cyrus would come through the gates. So this was marked in prophecy. It says, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And in Province and Kings 5.23, paragraph 1, it says, It was not long before reverses came. Babylon was besieged by Cyrus, nephew of Darius the Mede, and commanding general of the combined armies of the Medes and Persians. But within the seemingly impregnable fortress, with its massive walls and its gates of brass, protected by the river Euphrates, and stocked with provisions in abundance, the voluptuous monarch felt safe and passed his time in mirth and revelry. Okay, so they feel a bit secure about themselves, just as the Jews did in Jerusalem. The Romans looked at those walls and thought there was no way that they could have broken down those walls. It's the same as the walls of Babylon. They were 50 foot thick and 150 foot high. And Cyrus, when he, he comes here to look, there's no way. He, he, he sort of looks and thinks, how on earth am I going to get in there? That's why Belshazzar felt so secure. That's why people in this message, right, are also going to feel secure. And that's why it's going to come upon us suddenly and unexpectedly. It's a peace and safety message. Because it's a peace and safety message. This, the walls are high and walls are a symbol of God's law. When you think God's law is protecting you, you have nothing to fear. But if you've broken that law, then you can be sure that wall is not going to protect you. There's going to be a breach in it. So, I want us to look at now that feast. This, this drunken, licentious feast is taken there by Belshazzar. And this is, I'm reading from the Pioneer's writings now, from Stephen Haskell. And <clears throat> other references are, are in the notes, which I will post with this. It says, it was the last night of a nation's existence, but the people knew it not. Some slept in unconscious peace, some reveled and whirled away in thoughtless dance. In the dens of Babylon, men steeped in vice continued their wild orgies. In the palace halls, Belshazzar feasted with a thousand of his lords. Music resounded through the brilliant lighted rooms. The nobles lounged about the tables, sumptuously spread. Court women and concubines of the king entered those halls. It was a feast of Bacchus. And they drank to the health of the king on his throne. He ordered that the sacred vessels be brought from the temple to show that no being, human or divine, could raise a hand against him. The king of Babylon, the golden cup filled with wine, was raised and the blessing of Bel invoked. But it never reached the lips of the half-intoxicated king. His hand was stayed. Those vessels had been moulded by hands divinely skilled and after heavenly models. Angels had watched them as they were taken from the temple at Jerusalem and carried to Babylon. Messengers divinely appointed had guarded them. And their very presence in the heathen temple was a witness of the God of the Jews. Some day the silence would be broken. The desecration of his temple would not always remain unpunished. And we understand that uh, <clears throat> Belshazzar is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, who was his father, according to the Bible, but we know it's his, his grandfather. But he was repeating the sins of his father because he knew about the history of Nebuchadnezzar. He understood the stories of Daniel. He understood the book of Daniel and was repeating those same sins. Belshazzar represents the foolish virgins, right? That are repeating the sins of their fathers in this drunken feast, right? They're drunk on the wine of Babylon and they are committing a false marriage. Okay? Licentiousness is a false marriage. Right? It's, uh, we understand the literal demonstrates the spiritual. So because of their false doctrine right here, they are going to 
commit a, a false marriage. And um, <clears throat> we will see that coming together as we go through here. This is from E.T. Jones. Um, <clears throat> it says, Of all the ceremonies of the heathen, the mysteries were the most sacred and most universally practiced. Some mysteries were in honor of Bacchus, some of Cybele, but the greatest of all those considered the most sacred of all, the most widely practiced, were the uh, Eloisinian, so-called because celebrated at Eloises in Greece. But whatever was the mystery that was celebrated, there was always in it an essential part, as an essential part of it, the element of abomination that characterized sun worship everywhere, because the mysteries were simply forms of the widespread and multiform worship of the sun. Among the first of the perversions of the Christian worship was to give its forms and title and air of the mysteries. Okay, and it goes on. So... This drunken feast represents sun worship, typifying the Sunday law. S sun worship, right? And it's the feast of Bacchus. This is again from E.T. Jones. It says, on his return to Alexandria, fellow Peter resolved to be revenged upon the Jews who dwelt there for his repulse and disgrace at the temple in Jerusalem. Accordingly, he published a decree that none should be allowed to enter the palace gates who did not sacrifice to the gods. Uh, to the gods. <clears throat> there were three ranks of people of the inhabitants of Alexandria, and by both Alexander the Great and the first of the Ptolemies, the Jews there were enrolled in the first rank. Philo Peter decreed that they should all be reduced to the third or lowest rank. This required them to be enrolled anew. And he decreed that when they presented themselves for enrollment, they should have the badge of Bacchus, an ivy leaf, impressed upon them with a hot iron, and that all who should refuse this badge should be made slaves, that if any man refused to be slaves, they should be put to death. He did grant, however, that all who would renounce the worship of Jehovah and accept an initiation into the Egyptian religion should retain their original rank and privileges. Just like a parallel to the mark of the beast. And uh, Uriah Smith also writes about this. He gives uh, a secondary view on this. He says, Pedro says that Ptolemy, Ptolemy Philopeter ordered all the Jews who applied to be enrolled as as citizens of Alexandria to have the form of an ivy leaf, the badge of his god, Bacchus, impressed upon them with a hot iron under pain of death. The word used for mark in this prophecy is charagma and is defined to mean a graving sculpture, a mark cut in or stamped. It occurs nine, nine times in the New Testament and with the single exception of Acts 17.29 refers every time to the mark of the beast. We are not, of course, to understand in this symbolic prophecy that a literal mark is intended, but the giving, um, but the giving of the literal mark, as practiced in ancient times, is used as a figure to illustrate certain acts that will be performed in the fulfillment of this prophecy. And from the literal mark, as performed, formerly employed, we learn something of its meaning as used in the prophecy. For between the symbol and the thing symbolized, there must be some resemblance. The mark, as literally used, signified that the person receiving it was the servant of, acknowledged by authority of, or professed allegiance to, the person whose mark he bore. So the mark of the beast or the papacy must be some act or profession by which the authority of the power is acknowledged. What is it? Well, we see that it was to do with worship. If they renounced the worship of Jehovah and took up the, the worship of their gods, right, then he would allow them to maintain their, their initial position of top rank. Okay? But if you received that mark, if you did this, if you renounced the worship and worshipped, okay, Bacchus, right, which was this mark, this, this ivy leaf that had to be put in you, 
it was the mark of the beast. R real, real simple to see how these things are marked in the same thing. When the stamp is impressed. When, when, the, when the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, the character remains pure and spotless for eternity. Sister White puts the flying roll right here. She sticks it right here, and in that vision of the flying roll, she marks Ezekiel chapter 9. In Ezekiel chapter 9, the man with the writer's income goes through the midst of the city, right, and he's putting a mark upon the foreheads. So one is receiving the seal of God, the other ones are receiving the mark of Bacchus, right, the mark of the beast, this drunken revelry. Um, now we know, and we know that the third and the fourth are tied together. So that when you give a false message, you are in fact worshipping the sun. So we already understand that this, in Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel 9, is the punishment that comes upon you for this bowing down to worship the sun. So they're tying these things directly together. Now, this is from Stephen Haskell, again talking about this, this siege by Cyrus, it says, During the reign of Nabonidus and Belshazzar, events of the greatest importance occurred. To the Jews who accepted the words of the prophets whom God sent, rising up early and sending the downfall of the kingdom in the near future was well known. In spite of their own oppression, there was a world to be warned, and as the host of the redeemed gathered about the throne of God, made up, as it will be, of representatives of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, there will be some souls from ancient Babylon who, having heard the proclamation of the message, separated from our sins and were saved. Okay, you can see how that is typifying the end of the world. As the knowledge of God was lost by the ruling monarchs, and God-fearing men were no longer among the counselors, the oppression of the Jews became almost unbearable. On going into Babylon, they had been instructed by the Lord to build houses and to plant vineyards, to marry and increase in numbers, and to pray for the peace and prosperity of Babylon. This is just like when they went into Egypt, right? They were to increase in numbers and marry, right? And it reached a point where Pharaoh began to he put oppression on them about keeping the Sabbath. And it's a parallel to Babylon, right? How he's going to bring them out of Babylon. Uh, the time came when the Babylonians who were sun worshippers mocked the Jews because of the Sabbath they were forbidden to celebrate their feasts priests and rulers were degraded and persecuted the Babylonians often demanded songs from the Jews they that wasted us required of us mirth saying sing us one of the songs of Zion but their hearts were mournful Israel is a scattered sheep, wrote Jeremiah. The lions have driven him away. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. The Babylonians boasted that it was no sin to oppress the Jews, reasoning that God had placed the Hebrews in bondage because of their sins. It is little wonder that the yoke was hard to bear and that the king was unrelenting. It was a time of trouble, a foretaste of the great time of trouble through which the people of God will pass before the second coming of the Saviour. It says it right there. In the time of trouble that which they will pass before the second coming of their Saviour. So whatever happens at the close of the is typified in the binding of. Time of trouble they will go through before the second coming of their Saviour. Both periods are called by the same name. The time of Jacob's trouble by the prophet Jeremiah, under these trying circumstances, the Jews were obliged to preach the gospel which they once had the opportunity to give with the power from Jerusalem. Groaning beneath oppression, they had taught of the coming Messiah, the Deliverer. They taught righteousness by faith and the everlasting gospel, the hour of God's judgment, the fall of Babylon and the destruction of those upon whom was found the mark of Babylonian worship. So they're preaching the very same message. It's the everlasting gospel. And it's gone, the same message has gone down through history. 
The spirit of prophecy as belonging to the Jews was known to the Babylonians throughout the period of captivity. Daniel, in the presence of the king, had more than once received divine enlightenment. <clears throat> Ezekiel was sending messages broadcast from the Lord, and Jeremiah had received word from God with the command to make it known to all the nations round about. There was no hide in the fact that God of the Jews had prophets among his people. It was in this way that not only the Jews, but Moab, Edom, Tyre, Sidon, Ammon, Egypt, Arabia, and even Media and Persia knew that the fall of Babylon was decreed. Many of these nations and the Persians among the number knew just what kingdom would be used to destroy Babylon, and the name of the man whom God had chosen to accomplish the overthrow. Such are the messages which God sent. Okay? God sent the message right here, this rumour, to warn them of the impending judgment coming upon Babylon. And the message that he sent was the message of Cyrus. Okay? Very important. And thus it was that he made use of his people, those whom he could not use when granted peace and prosperity and a city of their own, he used when slaves under the iron heel of Babylon. Babylon was like a city on the edge of a volcanic crater, but she craved it not. Believed in, sorry? Believed it. Oh, sorry, she believed it not. In the year 539 BC, the general of the combined forces of the Medes and Persians started towards Babylon. The news reached the city that the enemy was on the march. Then it was that the message came to flee from the city and, as be, and be as goats upon the mountainside. Jews who heeded the word of the Lord then withdrew from Babylon, but the Persian army did not come. History says that Cyrus was stopped by the death of his sacred white horse, which was drowned in crossing a river. Cyrus set his men to digging channels for the river, spending one year in this way. Prophecy says the walls of Babylon shall fall. My people, go ye out of the midst of her, and deliver ye every man his soul. And lest your heart faint, and ye fear for the rumour that shall be heard in the land, a rumour shall both come one year, and after that in another year shall come a rumour. So it says here that in 539, B.C. Cyrus sets out, and we're going to see that it's in the spring. He sets out in 539 B.C. and this this rumor comes um, to warn him that it's coming, but he did not come. Right? It says there that this sacred white horse. They, they come across this river that's really fast forward. And this horse goes in the river and it drowns. And Cyrus is so enraged at this that he gets all his men off and they dig channels in this river to bring it low. He says, I will make this river so that even old women can cross it. And he spent so long doing this that he couldn't then, then not proceed. So he, he hunkers down there for the winter and it's the following spring that he begins on his journey back towards um, Babylon. Um, <clears throat> History says that Cyrus was stopped by the death of a sick... Okay, sorry, I read that. And so it was, one spring the rumour came, but the army failed to appear. The careless and unbelieving scoffed. But to the believing, this was an opportune time. The next spring the rumour came again. But there was no time then to sell or prepare to leave. For the army came also, and the Babylonian and Medo-Persian forces met in open battle. The Babylonians were defeated and returned within the fortifications of the city. So, in spring, there is a rumor comes. But one year later, in spring, I'm going to write it here. It's in the spring of 538 BC. Now, what's interesting here is that you see that 538 that Sister White ties in with the destruction of Jerusalem is parallel in 538, the destruction of Babylon. And they're both marking a Sunday law. Feast of Bacchus, right? Also lines up with uh, 
538 to 1798. Okay, they're, they're both showing the same truth. So 539 marks a warning, 538 marks the fulfillment. Okay, one year later. But we're going to see why the summer is important to understand. Uh, <clears throat> the gates were closed and the siege began. Those who were now in Babylon must live or die with the Babylonians, except God stay the hand of the destroyer. The climax was reached by the greatest of earthly governments. All heaven was alive with anxiety. Only man was asleep to his impending destruction. <coughs> this is the parable of the ten virgins. So, E.T. Jones again. God had not only long beforehand named the nations that should destroy Babylon, he had also called by name the general that should lead them. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. This was written about 712 BC. Cyrus started against Babylon in 539 BC and took it in 538 BC. According exactly what's written on the 1843 chart. It says there, overthrow of ancient Babylon, Daniel 5, 30 to 31, 538 BC. Okay, not 539. 539, the warning comes, right? But he tarried, did not come, right? It's one year later, the tarrying time leads you to 538, right? Very important to see and understand this. BC, not AD. 538 BC, sorry. Yeah, but they're, they're yeah. powerless. But you're right, I should have pointed to the right one. It says, When at last it was rumored that the Persian king had quitted Ecbatana, 539 BC, in the spring, and commenced his march to the southwest, Nabonidus received the tidings with indifference. His defences were completed. His city was amply provisioned. If the enemy should defeat him in the open field, he might retire behind his walls and laugh to scorn all attempts to reduce his capital either by blockade or storm. Cyrus, on his way to Babylon, came to the banks of the, the Gindis, a stream which, rising in the Matinian mountains, runs through the country of the Dardanians and empties itself into the river Tigris. When Cyrus reached this stream, which could only be passed in boats, one of the sacred white horses accompanying his march full of spirit and high metal walked into the water and tried to cross by himself. But the current seized him, swept him along with it, and it drowned him in its depths. Cyrus, enraged at the insolence of the river, threatened so to break its strength that in future even women should cross it easily without wetting their knees. Accordingly, he put off for a time his attack on Babylon, and dividing his army into two parts, he marked out by ropes 180 trenches on each side of the Gindis, leading off from it in all directions, and setting his army to dig some on one side of the river, some on the other, he accomplished his threat by the aid of so great a number of hands, but not without losing there by the whole summer season. Having, however, thus wreaked his vengeance on the Gindis by dispersing it through 360 channels, Cyrus, with the first approach of the ensuing spring, marched towards forward against Babylon. This local, merely incidental and seemingly trivial occurrence caused the delay of the whole army of Media and Persia for a whole year. Yet there was a matter of deep importance wrapped up in this delay, and even in the delay continued from one year to another. God's people were in Babylon, and they must know when its fall would be that they might save themselves. Right? God never punishes without a warning. 9-11 was a warning to prepare 
for the destruction of Babylon because we go into captivity in 9 11 in Babylon and we must flee from Babylon. We must come out of Babylon because it's about to be destroyed. And it's a parallel to the destruction of Jerusalem. We must see the sign, right? And when we see the sign, we must flee, right? Okay? When you shall see Jerusalem encompassed by armies. But you can't get out. You can't get out. When Cyrus came here, they couldn't get out. You, you only understand the sign when you came out of spiritual Babylon, when you freed yourself from false doctrines so that you understand line upon line what the sign is. Yes, yes. Daniel was still in Babylon there. Yeah. But this teaching us something. That Daniel had a purpose. Okay? <coughs> Daniel wasn't being disobedient to God in any way. He, he had a purpose to be in there. Um, thus, when Cyrus started out in the spring of 539 BC, Babylon heard the rumor and, and made all ready. But Cyrus stopped and stayed all summer through the fall and winter. And when spring came again, he started and again a rumor was heard in Babylon, followed swiftly by violence in the land. And ruler against ruler. That's kingdom against kingdom. Okay? That's the same message that Christ gives on the Mount of Olives. And that is why he stayed there at the river so long. God was over it all. He had said that two rumors a year apart should reach Babylon, that his people should certainly know when to go out of the midst of her and deliver every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. Okay, A.T. Jones, again in a different publication. It says, Cyrus carried on the siege for some time with no prospect of success against its mountain-high walls and its brazen iron-barred gates protected by an impassable moat. But midsummer coming on, and with the grand Babylonian festival in honor of the god of Tammuz. So, get this, right? Um, this is this feast right here they're talking about, this feast of Bacchus, and we're going to show that in a minute. It says, but midsummer coming on, and with it the grand Babylon festival in honor of the god Tammuz, Cyrus determined on a stratagem, knowing that the boundless license in which it was the wont of the Babylonians to indulge in that celebration, Cyrus went up the Euphrates at a considerable distance and dug channels by which to turn its waters from their course. As the Euphrates flowed through the city under the great walls, Cyrus' plan was to draw the water down so shallow that men could wade without difficulty and have them march into the city by the riverbed. But even that would have been no avail had not the Babylonians given themselves up to utter heedlessness in their wild orgies. For in each bank of the river within the city stood walls about 150 feet high with double gates of solid brass. And if only these gates had been shut or even washed, the Persians in the bed of the river would have been certainly caught in a trap. So you can see that right here, when Cyrus is drawing the water away from this river Gindis, it was a preparation for this one right here, because when he got here, he knew exactly what to do. He thought, ah, now I know what to do. I'm going to draw the water away, right, on the Euphrates, because it worked brilliantly here. And he, went, he planned for this feast, which is in the summer, right? We're going to show this. They're calling it the Feast of Tammuz. But here, if we read, Tammuz is just another sun god. But this is taken from, on the internet, from GeoCities. Um, it says, The word Tammuz is believed to be a derivative of two words. Tam, to make perfect or to perfect, and Muz, which relates to fire and light, such as sunlight. Tammuz is also referred to as Bacchus by many ancient writers. So Tammuz and Bacchus, it's the same thing. Bacchus means the lamented one, and at times he is referred to as Bacchus Ictus. Ictus referring to a fish. It's the Dagon, the fish god, 
right? Fishermen, in the story of Jesus, centuries later, we have the fishers of men and the identification with the fish as the symbol of the original Christians, right? It's complete nonsense, that's paganism. But this is these customs that get passed down. Um, but Bacchus and Tammuz, they both represent the worshipping of the sun. Now, Alexander Hislop, from his book, The Two Babylons, he also mentions something. He says the cross was the unequivocal symbol of Bacchus, the Babylonian Messiah, for he was represented with a headband covered with crosses. It has been well noted that drama works only because the audience knows that it isn't true. Therefore, we sing at the foot of the old rugged cross, only because we know that the blood of Jesus is not going to drip on us and we will not get jabbed with a spear. I mean, anyway, it's shown the counterfeit. This gospel. is the cross, right? The Bacchus feast is typifying the cross. It's a counterfeit. And it's the third step. It's the destruction of Jerusalem. It's the destruction of Babylon. It's true message versus false message. It's the Sabbath versus Sunday. It's the issue. It's the image of the beast test, right? Now, it's no accident. We're going to go to Patriarchs and Prophets 315 now. That when God's people come out of Egypt, right, that they have a drunken feast. Now Moses, he's on the mount in the cloud for 40 days and he's tarrying and Moses is a type of Christ. Cyrus was a type of Christ. They both tarry for this period, right? Complete parallels. But at the end of that period, God's people are having a drunken, revelrous orgy. It's the same feast, right? It's been paralleled right there. Patriarchs and Prophets 315 says, During this period of waiting, there was time for them to meditate upon the law of God which they had heard, and to prepare their hearts to receive the further revelations that he might make to them. They had none too much time for this work, and had they been thus seeking a clearer understanding of God's requirement and humbling their hearts before him, they would have been shielded from temptation. But they did not do this, and they soon became careless, inattentive, and lawless. Especially was this the case with the mixed multitude. They were impatient to be on their way to the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. It was only on condition of obedience that the goodly land was promised them, but they had lost sight of this. They were, there were some who suggested a return to Egypt, but whether forward to Canaan or backward to Egypt, the masses of the people were determined to wait longer for Moses. No, no longer for Moses. They get tired of the tarrying time. They want to go and do the work in their own strength. They don't want to tarry anymore. And in doing so, they are retreating back to Egypt. It's the exact thing they did. 40 days they go into the, spy out the land, and at the end they give a false message, and they pick a king and begin returning to Egypt. God has given us so many stories line upon line to show us this. And if we go to Exodus chapter 32, it says... <coughs> And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Aaron, Aaron is the high priest. He's the one that's meant to be watching over God's flock. And what does he do? He makes them a golden calf. It says, tomorrow is a feast of Bacchus. 
He gets them drunk, right, on the wine of Babylon. And when Moses comes down, right, it marks where the law is broken. Those, there's a breach in those walls, right? There's a breach in the walls, and therefore they have no defenses. And there are two classes separated. And Moses says, who is on the Lord's side? And who comes? The Levitical priesthood with the swords in their hands. And once those two classes are separated right here, he says, go ye through the midst of the city and slay not, spare not, neither old nor young. It's the exact same replica to Ezekiel 9. First of all, Moses makes them drink of the cup of his wrath. He, he breaks down that golden image and makes them drink it. It's the third angel's message. This is what they're doing right here with the golden cup. At this feast in Babylon, they're drinking from this, the, this the third angel's message. And then the angel of death comes right here. The men with the slaughter weapons and they slay not. Patriarchs and Proverbs 316 says, Such a crisis demanded a man of firmness, decision and unflinching courage, one who held the honour of God above popular favour, personal safety or life itself. But the present leader of Israel was not of this character. Aaron feebly remonstrated with the people, but his wavering and timidity at the critical moment only rendered them more determined. Okay, it was a crisis. This is the crisis, the Sunday law crisis. Acts of the Apostles 3.15 says, It was when the children of Israel sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play that they threw off the fear of God, which they had felt as they listened to the giving of the law, and making a golden calf to represent God. They worshipped it. And it was after enjoying a luxurious feast connected with the worship of Baal Peor, that many of the Hebrews fell through licentiousness. The anger of God was aroused, and at his command, three and twenty thousand were slain by the plague in one day. Sister White ties the the feast, the, the reverence feast at Baal Peor with this reverence feast where they worshipped the golden image. And it was right on the banks of Canaan where they did this. It was right on the banks of Canaan where the spies rebelled. Okay, the Lord's teaching us we are right on the banks of Canaan right now and there is a rebellion taking place and it's going to be fulfilled right here at midnight when it's fully manifested who's been drinking the wine of Babylon and who has been preparing themselves to see the sign and flee out of Babylon. So we're going to finish now. We're going to finish now. Um, <clears throat> if we can turn to um, 15 manuscript release and um, page 15. Just want to make a point before we close. So there's a quote here, um, <clears throat> real easy to understand, and it's talking about the image of the beast. And it begins, uh, this is from 15 Manuscript Release, page 15, paragraph 1. It says, several times during our conversation in which you become very much in earnest, you repeated the sentence, O consistency, thou art a Jew. I repeat the same with decided force to you. You say that Anna's visions place the coming, the, the forming of the image of the beast after probation closes. This is not so. You claim to believe the testimonies. Let them set you right on this point. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. Your position is such a jumble of inconsistencies that but few will be deceived. She then says, in Revelation 13, this subject is plainly presented. And when you go to Revelation 13, verses 11 to 17, it's talking about the Sunday law crisis that's set up in the United States of America. 
And the very next sentence says, this is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. Before they are sealed. Okay? The sealing period right here is a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so that you cannot be moved right here, that you will understand the truth. But when the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their characters remain pure and spotless for eternity. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath, refusing to worship Bacchus, will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the feast of Bacchus will receive the stamp of the ivy leaf in their skin. Okay, the mark of the beast. What need will there be of the solemn warning not to receive the mark of the beast when all the saints of God are sealed and ticketed for the new Jerusalem? O consistency, thou art a Jew. Very easy to see. The image of the beast test is the Sunday law test. And it's the crisis that comes right here. You're preparing now in your heart for which mark you're going to receive right here. Whether you're going to worship the true God or you're going to worship the God of Bacchus at this drunken, revelous feast because you've been filling your face with Babylonian wine, a false message that's been promulgated alongside the true right as we speak. So, to conclude, the destruction of Jerusalem, Christ said to them, that they knew not the time of their visitation. This it is talking about us at the end of the world who don't know the time of our visitation. We are saying, or some people are saying, that it's 539. But Christ is saying, uh-huh, the judgment doesn't come then, it's tarrying. Right? The judgment tarried in the Millerite time period on April 19th. The effect of every vision tarried on April 19th. And was fulfilled on October 22nd. 538 is the destruction of Jerusalem. 538 is the destruction of Babylon. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy give us the correct point in time. And it's going to be repeated in this time because God's people don't know the time of their visitation. So, brothers and sisters... We have to turn away from man and start turning to God's word, right? It's your only sure foundation. So, on those thoughts, we shall close with a word of prayer. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this great and wonderful truth how you tell us that the, the pioneers who are dead, their voices are to speak to us and how you've given us all this solemn ancient history that lines up with Bible prophecy to understand these great themes that are all in agreement, in agreement with the sacred charts that you've given us, in agreement with the spirit of prophecy and in agreement with the Bible. This is one solemn unanimous and united truth that does not disagree with itself. Please help us to ensure that our feet are on a solid platform of truth and not on a platform of sand that's human traditions and theories that are a jumble of inconsistencies. Please help us to use Miller's rules and remember that we have to bring all the subject matter together and if we can prove our theory without a contradiction then and only then we know that we have the truth. We praise you, Lord, for the simple means by which you bring the truth to us. Please help us to be like little children as we come to the foot of the cross to be taught of thee and not to be taught by human beings. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you and we thank you for this warning that you've given us. And I pray that you'll help us to make the necessary preparations to flee from Babylon, that when that sign comes, Lord, we will be ready. And we thank you and ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.